Silence of the Lambs. It was one of the most shocking movies of all time and created perhaps the most terrifying serial killer in film history. In fact, the story was inspired by an actual FBI unit whose members revolutionized the pursuit of America's deadliest criminals. A Los Angeles parking lot, moments after the body of a 21-year-old woman was found, strangled. These pioneers went far beyond traditional forensic evidence to probe the minds of the killers. I was just fascinated with violent criminal behavior. They scoured police case files to dissect the most shocking crimes. After peeling the face off, he would put motor oil on it to keep the skin supple, and then he would put lipstick on the mask as well. They overturned the public's preconceptions of serial killers. My name is Chet Lally, and I'm the the case. People want to think that, that these individuals look like monsters, like Freddy Krueger, and yet many of them look like Ted Bundy. And discovered new strategies to make the killers confess. My special goal was to go out and get a blonde lady and have sex with her and kill her. Even if you're sitting across the table from someone who rapes and murders and engages in post-mortem mutilation, they still love to talk to women. This is the true story of The Silence of the Lambs. This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. The Silence of the Lambs premiered in 1991. Starring Jodie Foster and Anthony Hopkins, it gripped audiences and won a string of awards for its terrifying portrayal of a female FBI agent's search for a serial killer. But as sensational as it seems, the story was actually rooted in real life. Mr. Thomas Harris. In 1980, its author, Thomas Harris, gained access to the FBI's new behavioral science unit in Virginia. Harris had heard reports of an astonishing new idea being pioneered there, one that promised to change forever ways of catching the most dangerous criminals. He was definitely interested in the serial killers. He wanted to know the psychological makeup of these killers and, and really what their motivation was. That's, that's the key thing. There's a killer loose in the Los Angeles area, or maybe more than one, raping and strangling young women. Law enforcement agencies have 30 detectives on the case, but the murder wave continues. In the 70s, U.S. homicide rates had doubled, and what terrified people the most was the emergence of a new type of killer. These savage predators murdered for their own gratification and would kill repeatedly until they were caught. The term serial killer was uh, brand new. Uh, Bob Ressler and John Douglas, two members of the Behavioral Science Unit, originated that particular term, uh, serial killer, and uh, it caught on quickly. The agents told Thomas Harris that serial killers rarely had any prior connection to their victims and left few clues, making them notoriously hard to catch. The new approach, called criminal profiling, looked beyond conventional forensic evidence to unlock the minds of killers. Harris learned that the unit had just scored its first big success, helping police to solve a disturbing murder. We showed Harris the crime scene of Francine Elverson, per se, and how she was left in this horrific position, almost like a, a, like a moth, the way she was uh, spread out. October 12, 1979, the Bronx, New York City. The body of 26-year-old Francine Elvison was discovered on the top floor of her apartment building. She had been strangled, sexually assaulted, and mutilated, and words had been scrawled on her skin. The NYPD's best lead was a single pubic hair found on the body. Forensic tests revealed that it had come from a black person. But after a six-month-long manhunt, the police investigation stalled. In desperation, they turned to the new unproven idea of criminal profiling. The thing that was difficult was that we were not always accepted. 
you could be invited out on a case. But that doesn't mean that, that the detectives that you're going to be working with want you there. The unit's profilers believed that killers often left a unique signature at the crime scene. Using their psychological expertise, they could glean insights to the killer's identity that a traditional detective might overlook. The Elvison case was a chance to prove to the police that the idea worked. So they came to Quantico and, and we sat in a, in a table and they were presenting the facts and it was an unbelievable case. The unit's violent crimes expert, John Douglas, started to analyze the grisly clues the killer had left behind. The killer took her earrings off and placed them in corners. The nipple uh, was removed and there were bite marks on the, the inner thigh. He left a piece of art for, for shock value. Also working the case was profiler Roy Hazelwood. He believed the fact that the killer had spent so much time at the crime scene without being spotted was a significant lead. We believe that the offender may have known the victim but lived within close proximity because he spent an inordinate amount of time with the victim in an occupied building. Uh, so he had to be very familiar with uh, the comings and goings of people there as well as with the uh, neighbors. Another clue led the team to deduce that the killer had acted on impulse when he attacked his victim. We said that because he didn't bring a weapon. He relied upon her purse strap to strangle her with. And the warped nature of the crime suggested the killer had been in the grip of a psychotic disorder. One of the things we said is he's probably been institutionalized or has recently been released from an institution. Using their knowledge of criminal psychology to interpret these small but significant clues, the team was able to construct a distinctive offender profile. So we described an individual who would be living in this uh, complex who had some, obviously some type of, of mental, uh, mental problems. But there was one piece of evidence that didn't fit, the single hair that had led police to seek a black killer. He said, you know something? I don't know about you guys here, but based upon the elements of this case, I, said, I don't know about this hair, but this is a crime of a white man. The profiler's experience told them that sadistic sexual killers almost always choose victims from within their own racial group. They told the NYPD they should be looking for a white man. When we gave the profile, uh, they said that they had a suspect but it couldn't be him because he was in a mental institution at the time. We suggested they check the bite marks on the victim with the teeth of the individual they suspected. Turned out there was a match. The profilers were right. The bite mark implicated a 30-year-old unemployed man whose father lived in Francine Elverson's apartment block. The NYPD had initially dismissed him because he was white. He had also claimed to be in a mental hospital at the time of the murder, but his alibi quickly fell apart. He was in a mental institution, literally walked away from the institution, came home because that's where he had lived with his father, uh, committed the crime, and then went back to the institution. The killer was sentenced to life imprisonment. The profilers were convinced that he would have gone on to kill again. It later emerged that the hair found on Francine Elvison's body had been accidentally transferred from a contaminated body bag. The role played by criminal profiling in solving the case won over the skeptics in America's largest police force, the NYPD. We received phone calls. Uh, they were grateful for the assistance and uh, said that we had made disciples of them. They were astounded you know, by the, the accuracy of, and the analysis, which is a big deal when you have at the police department 33,000, 40,000 officers said, hey, man, maybe these guys know something. The criminal profilers of the behavioral science unit were revolutionizing the approach to violent crime. Thomas Harris's hit novel, Silence of the Lambs, would soon bring their work to a much wider audience. 
and his book's gripping plot would come straight from an audacious real-life initiative that sent profilers into the serial killer's lair. In the movie Silence of the Lambs, rookie FBI agent Clarice Starling is hunting a serial killer on the loose. Starling is pursuing leads she has gleaned from interviews with jailed serial killer Hannibal Lecter. It sounds like Hollywood fantasy, but has its roots in a remarkable real-life project launched by the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit. In 1978, profilers Bob Ressler and John Douglas started going into jails to interview serial killers face-to-face. -face. The aim? To gain insights that might help solve future crimes. Off we went into the prisons and learning from the bad guys and looking to see, you know, what created these monsters. You have to go in there and you can't be shocked by what they did. You become their buddy uh, you know, while you're in there for that interview. And it's amazing. It, it's amazing what you can get out of them. Why do they agree to be interviewed? And it all goes to narcissism. Uh, they want to feel important. The interview process allowed Ressler and Douglas to probe the serial killer's dark world and to understand what motivated their crimes. It's not about killing. That's not the game uh, here at all. It's about you know, the, the power and the, uh, and the control. It also explained one puzzling aspect of these killers' behavior, why so many of them kept incriminating evidence linking them to their victims. We learned through our research that to some offenders, personal items represented a trophy, victory, conquest. One offender told me it served as a reminder as to what I had accomplished. To other offenders who took personal items, it represented a souvenir. By shedding light on their crimes, the killers were helping profilers acquire the tools they needed to catch future offenders. This became the central storyline of Silence of the Lambs, but with a twist. Thomas Harris realized his tale would be even more gripping if his profiler was a woman. To make his heroine truly believable, he needed to get inside the head of a real female agent. I was just fascinated with violent criminal behavior and from the behavioral standpoint. And so I, I truly wanted to be in that unit. That was one of my, my goals. At the time, there were no female FBI profilers, but the unit was able to put Harris in touch with Pat Kirby, an ambitious FBI field agent. I had no idea that Tom Harris was thinking of writing Silence of the Lambs. At the time, I didn't know, even know who Tom Harris was. As a former homicide detective, Pat Kirby had first-hand experience of dealing with serial killers, making her invaluable to Harris. He was trying to determine how it, a female main character would fly and how realistic would it be, what would it be like. Therefore, he was talking to me about how it is to be a woman in that position. As a field agent, Kirby had liaised with the unit's profilers on several cases. And I think the, the impression oftentimes was that a woman's going to be cringing and she's going to be doing all this. And so that's what I could tell Tom Harris, that a woman can do it in many ways, I think, better than a man because a woman will listen more and not judge. And that lack of judgment um, entices someone to be more forthcoming. Harris's meetings with Pat Kirby helped him to create agent Clarice Starling, played by Jodie Foster in the movie. When Kirby saw the film, she was impressed by how convincing Starling was. She was not um, a big sophisticate, and she was driven. And the thing that I like was her tenacity. It's, it's like a, a Jack Russell Terry or something that just grabs a hold of you and, and just won't let go. And I mean, that was, was so realistic and so an important part of doing the, the profiling job. But in 1980, Kirby's goal of becoming a real life profiler seemed a distant dream. She says, I want to be in your unit. And I said, well, 
you're a long way from being in our unit. I said, you have to serve in the field for five years before we'll even consider uh, you coming into the unit. And she said, I'll be in the unit. And I think three years later, four years later, she was in the behavioral science unit. Uh, that's how good Pat Kirby was. Kirby finally joined the behavioral science unit in 1984. There, in an uncanny echo of the movie, she became the very first female profiler to interview a serial killer. Special Agent Kirby. Special Agent Resler. Randy Woodfield had been convicted in 1981 for multiple sexual assaults and the murders of three women along the interstate connecting Washington and California. The unit interviewed all serial killers as part of their ongoing research project. But this time, Chief Profiler Bob Ressler was planning an experiment. What is it that you want? Bob started to ask him some questions. Well, you could see it was just banter and it was going nowhere. And Randy was looking for, you know, some time in his day to fill. It was, it was pretty much what it seemed like. The interview was getting nowhere. Then, to Kirby's surprise, Resler suddenly left the room. In the movie Silence of the Lambs, Agent Starling is protected from Hannibal Lecter by thick safety glass. Kirby had nothing to protect her from a serial sex killer. I have to say, I mean, I felt a little at first knowing his background and sitting there and his victims, of course, were all women. In fact, Resler was never more than a few feet away. His departure was a ruse to see whether, alone with a woman, Woodfield might be tempted to talk. You're trying to play this, it's like a game of chess. You're trying to play the game smarter and better. But he kept the same kind of banter and the same more playing off, kind of kind of chatting. And all of a sudden, I see Bob's head popping in the window. <laughs> He's obviously set this up. Although the experiment didn't produce a breakthrough, Kirby was convinced that female profilers could bring a valuable new perspective to the pursuit of serial killers. Murder statistics show that 95% of serial killers are men, while their victims are overwhelmingly women. You've got to get that victimology. You've got to understand where, how your victim would be. Would she have fought? Would she have been frightened? And would she have panicked? And in understanding that, you, you begin to understand how the killer responds. And who better understands that than a woman? Thomas Harris had his heroine. Now he needed the killer who would alternately torment her and feed her clues. Once again, a real-life case would help him create a legendary anti-hero. <laughs> Dr. Hannibal Lecter is a psychopath who kills to satisfy his sadistic urges. But until his capture, he led an outwardly normal life as a brilliant psychiatrist. It sounds far-fetched, but this ability to lead a convincing double life is shared by one of America's most infamous serial killers, a man the profilers were studying during Harris's research visits. We were all fascinated by Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy was, uh, was one of the uh, best things, if I can use that term, that ever happened uh, to the public's understanding of serial killers because Ted Bundy was articulate, he was intelligent, he was a college graduate, uh, he was a law student, he was attractive, uh, he was a guy next door. So that convinced the public they, that they're not all toothless and uh, balding and uh, crazy, if you will. Good afternoon, Susan. My name is Ted Bundy and I'm the defendant in the case and I'm just here to introduce myself. When Ted Bundy stood trial in 1979, accused of sadistic rape, murder, and necrophilia, many people didn't believe he could be a serial killer. I'm not afraid of him. He just doesn't look like the type to kill somebody. Like Lecter, Bundy was charming and well-educated. He had a degree in psychology. He was studying law. To the outside world, he appeared perfectly normal.
Five years earlier, the bodies of three middle-class college girls had been discovered in Seattle, Washington. Four more were missing. They had been raped and murdered in frenzied attacks. But it was clear that the killer had initially been able to gain their trust. Here was this guy who was very good looking and articulate and handsome. Um, people reported that he used cast on his arm to lure girls into um, to coming with him and helping him. That's like America's worst nightmare. Uh, do you happen to have a light? Oh, uh, no, I uh, He took high risks. He would openly approach his victims and use a con, a trick, a ruse, pretend to be a police officer, offer assistance, uh, ask for help. What they wouldn't realize is that the passenger side, the seat was missing. Bam, she'd be hit in the back of the head and pushed off to the floor and then she'd be cuffed and then taken away. The killer was able to abduct women in broad daylight because he didn't fit his victim's image of a murderer. I think he really tore down our defenses because at that point we realized we can't really spot the person who could um, pose the greatest danger to us. The killing spree continued in Idaho, Colorado, and Utah. Then, in August 1975, police stopped a man for careless driving in Salt Lake City. Good evening, sir. Good evening. I assume you have some ID with you? Yes, sir. It was Ted Bundy. In the trunk of his car, police found a gym bag containing handcuffs, rope, and a ski mask. In the front seat well, they discovered a crowbar. Bundy was arrested on suspicion of burglary. Jerry Thompson was a homicide detective investigating the murders of five young women in Utah. Learning of the bizarre finds in Bundy's car, he got a warrant to search his apartment. Everything was perfectly in place. I looked in his closet. All his shoes were down on one shelf, and I observed the patent leather shoes. It seemed innocent enough, except Thompson knew that a few weeks earlier, a man wearing patent leather shoes had tried to abduct a 19-year-old woman called Carol Duranch. And she remembered these, these what she called his shiny shoes. His suspicions growing, Thompson searched further. I found a, a brochure from the uh, Humont High School play. And that rung a bell with me because we had a missing girl that was taken that night. Carol Duranch later identified Bundy in a police lineup, and he was charged with attempted kidnapping. His credit card statements proved that he had been in the right place at the right time for five murders. But Thompson would have a hard time convincing his colleagues that this likable young man was a sadistic killer. He was very personable, and we laughed and joked, and he was a jovial individual. He was always had this snicker and laugh. But Bundy's charm didn't fool Thompson. He was, uh, I want to say, too cooperative. Like Lecter, Bundy was a devious and brilliant manipulator. Even experienced police detectives started to think that Thompson had the wrong man. During that time, it was, uh, it was quite stressful because there were a lot of people that was uh, re- This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. Kind of against me. Even among some of my own officers around there is that 
that you got the wrong guy, you know, and you're gonna end up hurting you or the department. There were a lot of people that felt that I was ruining this fine, substantial attorney that was gonna be because he was uh, going to law school and he was this or that and that he was such a nice guy. The charismatic Bundy had worked as a Republican campaigner and the party even raised money for his defense. Bundy's plausible front threw many off guard and would lead to disastrous consequences. They were very lean during recess or letting him move about and do things and, and I made comments to him I said you know you're gonna lose this guy no no we've got to be good friends with Ted here he you don't have to worry about him you know they let him go down at one one time in the courtroom down where they had a, uh, a drink machine I said you know I don't like this you know Thompson was right to be suspicious Bundy had no intention of standing trial just like Lecter in Silence of the Lambs, he was planning an audacious escape. In the movie Silence of the Lambs, psychopath Hannibal Lecter escapes to kill again. In 1979, real-life serial killer Ted Bundy was in jail awaiting trial for a string of murders. But Bundy had other plans. He got hold of a hacksaw blade from another prisoner, sawed his way through a roof panel in his cell, and escaped. Six weeks later, Bundy broke into a Florida State University sorority house. He bludgeoned, raped, and murdered two young women. Three weeks later, he killed his final victim, a 12-year-old girl, before finally being recaptured. If I get you help, why are you okay? <coughs> I don't have enough time to tell you why. The three-piece suit was escorted into the courtroom. The Bundy trial gripped America. The public struggled to accept that a crazed serial killer could look so normal. The evidence involved things like bite marks and necrophilia and serial murder. And then you look at this man and you think, look how good looking he is. He's dressed in a suit. He smiles. He's articulate. And I think that to me that is absolutely one of the essential components of serial murders. People want to think that, that these individuals look like monsters, like Freddy Krueger. And yet many of them look like um, Ted Bundy. Bundy's courtroom performance wasn't enough to overturn the mass of evidence against him. Ten years later, in January 1989, he was executed by electric chair. Ted Bundy's capture was a result of sheer luck rather than profiling. But his case gave the profilers crucial new insights and helped author Thomas Harris create a terrifying and believable serial killer. He gave Hannibal Lecter further gruesome but realistic traits from the profiler's files. One was a taste for human flesh. He told us that he had uh, wanted to create the most violent and despicable killer that uh, he could. Lecter was launched in the novel Red Dragon, with Silence of the Lambs following five years later. However extreme he seems, his behavior is rooted in real-life cases. Like Ted Bundy, Lecter is a textbook manipulative psychopath who thrives on risk. Even though he's in custody, he kills the, the, the two officers down in Tennessee almost in front of, of the whole task force. And he's bringing to life that trait of risk-taking and, and thrill-seeking. The hallmark of a psychopath is really that their lack of empathy and their lack of ability to um, have a conscience for what they do. And one of Lecter's most sickening crimes is consistent with an intriguing scientific fact about psychopaths. He had bitten the tongue out of somebody's mouth and his blood pressure didn't go up at all.
Numerous studies have shown that disturbing images provoke a strong physiological reaction in normal people. But when the same images are shown to psychopaths, their pulse and heart rate remain perfectly normal. We know because of the research that their blood pressure could be very normal, their heart rate can be very normal, and yet on the outside, they're doing horrendous things, biting out a tongue, stabbing somebody 81 times, and yet they're very cool, calm, and collected. To create Hannibal Lecter, Harris had combined the traits of several killers who had committed some of the worst crimes on record. The real-life case that inspired his final chilling character would need little embellishment. In The Silence of the Lambs, Buffalo Bill, played by Ted Levine, abducts and murders women. Not for the excitement of the kill, but for access to their skins. Once again, Harris's inspiration had its roots in a horrific real-life crime from the Behavioral Science Unit's case files. While researching his novel, Harris had attended a seminar on Ed Gein. This deranged killer from the 50s had been largely forgotten, but was legendary among the unit's profilers. That fascinated him. That case really fascinated him, and, in that, and through that case, very, very much in depth. Gein was a 51-year-old bachelor from Plainfield, Wisconsin. In 1957, the discovery of his dreadful crimes horrified America and the world. On November 16th, Bernice Warden, the town's general store owner, was reported missing. When Warden's son mentioned Ed Gein as a regular customer, police decided to visit his isolated farmhouse outside town. Gein, this is the police. One of them was local sheriff Frank Searles. He remembers Gein as a reclusive and eccentric character. He never talked much to anybody. He just kind of a loner, you know. Once in a while when he did say something, it would be something that would uh, kind of bother people. Like one lady I know, he, he cut her apron strings and told her to enjoy her Christmas because it might be her last. And she just laughed because she thought he was joking. Dean, you in here? Finding the doors of the house locked, the officers decided to look inside the woodshed. What awaited Searles was a scene more horrific than anything Hollywood could invent. Whoa! What? I seen a shadow and I turned the flashlight up and uh, Mrs. Warden was hanging there. <laughs> when you kill a, a deer, why they, they hang them up to to cool out, so to speak, and that's what he was doing with her. She was hanging by her heels. Officers broke into the house and found that the brutal murder of Bernice Warden was only Gein's latest atrocity. What they encountered was a real house of horrors. Uh, body parts of ladies where he, he, he skinned them out. cut the skulls off, and he used the skulls for dishes to feed his dogs and cats with. Then, officers stumbled upon a paper bag. In it, they made perhaps their most appalling discovery. A human face. They recognized it as belonging to local bar owner Mary Hogan, who'd gone missing three years earlier. It would be like a mask that you were going to buy to wear for Halloween. It was just eye holes and stuff. There was no, no, no bone structure. It was just skin. Unbelievably, Gein had peeled the face off in order to wear it as a mask. 
After incising the head in the back and peeling the face off, he would put motor oil on it to keep the skin supple, and then he would put a lipstick, a lipstick on, uh, you know, on the mask as well. He would lace them up, tie it up, and then uh, when, when, it, uh, when it was the time was right for him to do this, he then would bounce his image off of mirrors and dance around and, and uh, you know, thinking of himself as a, you know, as a woman. Just like Buffalo Bill, Gein killed his victims in a deluded attempt to become a woman. Was his motivation to kill people? Clearly not. What he wanted was what? He wanted their skin. He wanted to, to uh, sew an outfit for himself. So the murder would have been a means to the end. He really wanted to be, he wanted to change his gender. Just like Buffalo Bill, he wanted to be a, uh, be a female. And this was their way, their warp way of, uh, of doing it. Ed Gein was arrested at a local diner. He eventually confessed to two murders. His other gruesome trophies came from the corpses of women he dug up from nearby graveyards. He was declared insane and spent the rest of his life in a mental institution. The Behavioral Science Unit had given Thomas Harris an incredible insight into the minds of serial killers and the world of the profilers who pursued them. His best-selling novel would become perhaps the ultimate Hollywood thriller. Silence of the Lambs became a huge hit after its release in 1991. More importantly, it spread the word about criminal profiling with the police. A much larger number of law enforcement became aware of what we were doing, and they in turn uh, sent more cases to us. The movie, The Silence of the Lambs, uh, kind of paved the way like John the Baptist did for Jesus. And the film left another legacy. Jodie Foster's memorable portrayal of Agent Starling triggered an upsurge of women applying to become FBI profilers. The biggest result was a, a recruitment of a number of women. I, I can't n number how many calls I got from various and sundry people who wanted to come into the unit and do what uh, uh, she did. The Silence of the Lambs had helped to spread the word about profiling among police departments, and it had spawned a new generation of female profilers. Former FBI agent Mary Ellen O'Toole joined the newly renamed Behavioral Analysis Unit as a profiler in 1995, convinced that women would have an advantage when it came to quizzing serial killers, and she was determined to prove it. These guys are fascinated by women. They don't have that kind of relationship with women that quote-unquote normal men do. Six years later, O'Toole would get a chance to test the theory when police asked her to persuade a psychopathic killer to confess. I work in the, the behavioral analysis unit. Are you familiar with that? I've heard of it. In the years following the Silence of the Lambs release, criminal profiling had continued to benefit from the boost the movie had given it among police departments. Detectives became more willing to call on profilers, not only to analyze crime scenes, but just as in the film, to extract crucial information from the killers. In November 2001, detectives in King County, Washington, arrested 52-year-old Gary Ridgway, a factory worker who they suspected of being the Green River Killer. This sexual sadist and necrophiliac had been targeting prostitutes around Seattle and Tacoma since the 80s. He strangled his victims with rope or fishing line and dumped their bodies near the Green River. Ridgway admitted to four murders, those in which police had recovered DNA evidence, but they were convinced he had killed more. In a controversial deal, prosecutors agreed that he could escape the death penalty if he made a full confession and revealed where he had hidden the bodies. It really should have been, in the minds of law enforcement, a quick debrief. Show us where the bodies are, tell us the murders you've done in King County, and we'll, be, we'll cooperate them and the case will be resolved. Ridgway told detectives where to find three more bodies, but after a month of interviews, they were convinced he was still holding out. Yesterday also that uh, you're, you're taking a lot of people off here with um, 
the types of information that you're able to recall and the other types of information that you're not able to recall. Police spent days driving Ridgeway around King County in a bid to pinpoint where he had dumped his victims. You, you, you see this area over here, though, where you're yes. talking about you would have put her over. Does that help you at all decide if this is the it area? Was the, uh, it was dark, and it, it looks like this area, yeah. Um, but this, you, I think this is the road. You think this is the yeah. road? Yeah. It's a little discouraging when we bring you out here for three times and you're still iffy about, you know, even sounding like it if this is the road. This. Ask you one last time, is this the road at least that you put I'm, your body? I'm really quite sure this is the road, yes. Okay. I don't know if that makes me feel any better. He was a pathological liar, and he would lie about everything, even points, issues that were not important. And because it was, it was kind of difficult to make sense out of why is this guy dragging out this confession. Frustrated by Ridgeway's games, detectives called on the behavioral analysis unit for help. And just as in Silence of the Lambs, it was decided that Ridgeway might reveal more to a woman. Mary Ellen O'Toole, one of the new wave of female profilers, was convinced she could get to the truth. Even if you're sitting across the table from someone who rapes and murders and um, engages in post-mortem mutilation of their female victims, they still, for the most part, love to talk to women. Just as Agent Starling did with Lecter, O'Toole decided she would play to her subject's vanity, treating the psychopathic Ridgeway as her teacher. When you go in with that degree of curiosity, the interview just naturally becomes all about them. And that becomes very important because um, they're very self-centered and very narcissistic, so they want to talk about themselves. Yeah. O'Toole's approach soon started to pay off as Ridgeway revealed how he chose his victims. My special goal was to go out and get a blonde lady and have sex with her and kill her. Okay. Choose. It's their need to be center stage, their need to be the best serial killer. They're not ashamed of being a serial killer, but their need to lecture you and tell you how it really is. After days of patient questioning, O'Toole made a breakthrough. Ridgeway started confessing to murders the police didn't even know about. I killed uh, Mayhem, I think it was Mayhem, her name is. And then I went back and had sex with her at least, at least twice. Mm -hmm. And then the night that I was having sex with her, uh, that's when I, uh, the uh, security guard came by and spotted me. So I had, to, I had to bury her. There's already at least two bodies, one or two bodies already there. She's buried basically here on the side of the hill. There's one somewhere over here under the brush nails here and wears is here. Some of his victims he identified not by name, but by the number of the highway nearest to where he left their bodies. She was uh, in a cluster out of 410. The four, okay. 410 cluster. Okay. Uh, eight of them, seven or eight of them. For six months, the body count went on mounting. The interviews ultimately led to the police recovering the bodies of 48 women, making Ridgeway America's most prolific serial killer. Do you understand that you're charged now with 48 counts of aggravated first-degree murder? Yes. And you understand that... O'Toole's approach helped police to close the case and return the victim's remains to their loved ones. And it confirmed that female profilers could play a valuable role, just as the fictional agent Clarice Starling had in the movie. The Silence of the Lambs owes its chilling power to Thomas Harris's research at the Behavioral Science Unit in the exhilarating early days of profiling. It was the best work experience of my entire life. 
uh, was within the behavioral science unit because there was never a dull moment. There was always a new, more exciting case that came in. And so we had the opportunity of acting out in real life, what you typically only see in movies. Harris's story was gripping because it was authentic, born out of genuine encounters, real life characters, and the crimes of actual serial killers. Tom Harris wanted a lot more detail in the crimes we talked to him about than, than a lot of people would. I think that showed up a great deal in, in what Hannibal Lecter does, for example, in some of his crimes. We were hoping he put something somewhat realistic and uh, truthful uh, together, and uh, we, were, we were impressed by what he put together. Dozens of serial killer movies have been released since the 90s, but The Silence of the Lambs still stands out because it captured a seismic shift in the pursuit of society's most violent and disturbing criminals. This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised.